with a compelling perspective on global politics. This is the Patrick Henningsen Show on TNT Radio. All right, folks, back, back, back. We're back, we're back. Second hour, last segment of the second hour here. Thank you, Blake Lovewell. Great discussion on the World War grift. This is a topic that is not going away. Blake's been looking into it. He's got a great piece coming up, which he's going to publish at 21st Century Wire. And Blake's articles are packed with information and research. So we're looking forward to that, sharing that with everybody here, dropping that in the TNT chat room as well. Hello to everybody again in the TNT chat room. Great to see you guys in there and active as well. Good numbers as well today. But uh, let's pivot right now back to uh, Middle East, back to world politics, UK politics. Basil Valentine, our intrepid correspondent, joining us on the line right now. Basil, how are you doing? Very well, thank you, Patrick. Good to be with you. And hello to our viewers and listeners all around the world. So, Basil, what is the latest right now uh, in the Middle East? And I want to get over to the UK political reaction. There's been some developments on this. I've seen Lord Cameron, the foreign minister. Uh, he has made a comment about Palestinian statehood. I find to be perplexing at this time. I want to get your take on that. But just on the ground right now, what is the situation uh, in, in Gaza? Well, the hot news on the diplomatic front is that a draft peace proposal has been put to both the Israelis and Hamas uh, by the Paris conference. Uh, Mohammed Nazal of the Hamas Political Bureau, speaking on Al Jazeera a couple of hours ago, said that the Hamas Political Bureau is now going to study the proposal before traveling to Cairo to continue their negotiations with Egyptian and Qatari mediators. Um, the talk, of course, is of a ceasefire. 45 days has been mentioned. But Hamas say they are only interested in an agreement that leads, even if it's in stages, to a permanent ceasefire. They cannot accept the so-called humanitarian pause if it means the bombing is going to continue. They also require the complete withdrawal from Gaza of all Israeli troops and the allowing, of course, of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, interestingly enough, a couple of those demands are exactly what the ICJ is calling for. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it looks as if the Israeli war cabinet uh, and then the larger so-called security cabinet uh, is likely to reject it, the major sticking point remaining the duration of the pause in the fighting. Israel is coming under increasing pressure domestically to do more to try and secure the release of the hostages, even though uh, Benjamin Netanyahu said in his interview with Douglas Murray uh, yesterday that basically he didn't really care about the fate of the hostages and that winning the war was more important. Um, nevertheless, the hostages are an important bargaining chip in all this. And certainly from Hamas's point of view, uh, apparently, starting with women and children, they are willing to release all the Israeli hostages if it leads to a permanent ceasefire. However, although a ratio of one to 250 has been suggested in terms of the uh, prisoner swap on both sides, 250 Palestinians uh, held in Israeli jails for every uh, Israeli prisoner held by Hamas. Um, there are substantial elements of the Israeli government who do not want to see the mass release of Palestinian prisoners who would veto it. So a couple of big sticking blocks here. And um, although it might be achievable in stages, it seems to be a lot of distance between the two sides still. Yeah, so I saw that. Uh, I I don't think it's I don't think the you know fifty uh, Hamas releasing fifty uh, Israeli hostages. Uh, some of those are military, by the way. Um, uh, in exchange for two hundred and fifty Palestinians that have been held in administrative detention in the gulags uh, in Israel, not a bad deal. Not a bad deal because look, if if it accelerates a cessation of hostilities, then why not take it? 
uh, they get what they want. The other side gets what they want. But it's funny that um, Israel always has this problem. And you know what the headlines are going to be, Basil. You know how this goes. Um, Israel will go to the media and to the world, to the U.S., saying, we offered them a good ceasefire deal. And like always, the corrupt Palestinian leadership rejected this great deal that we offered them. Have you heard that one before? Uh, we heard it at Oslo. We heard it when Ehud Barak famously went to Camp David with Yasser Arafat just before the end of the Clinton presidency. So we've heard that a lot in the past. Um, you know, the problem we've got, of course, is that substantial elements in the Israeli government who were at the settlers jamboree earlier this week, uh, far from withdrawing from Gaza, they want to settle it. They want to take it over. They want to steal it, basically. So, you know, on the one hand, you've got international mediators uh, saying, well, including supposedly the US saying, well, you know, Israel is going to have to withdraw from Gaza uh, at some point from the rubble. Uh, you've got, you know, large parts of Israeli government and society saying, no, we, we want it for ourselves. So there's a huge gulf there as well, of course, as uh, the fact that this deal, if it leads to a permanent ceasefire, would mean that Hamas continues to exist, whether or not they are part of any future government, um, you know, is a moot point. You know, I don't think the Americans would find that acceptable, but uh, the Israelis want to, or so they say, they want to eliminate Hamas right down to the last individual right down to the guy who cleans the tunnels and the bloke who does the letter set or whatever, you know, um, and a ceasefire that came into force over the next week or so, if it was to become permanent, would mean that the vast majority of senior Hamas commanders uh, and of the people who've been doing the fighting uh, on the ground and underground in Gaza would remain alive. So... Hmm. And stronger yeah. than ever, uh, uh, Basil, and and, and battle hardened. They've taken the best shot, uh, and they'll they'll make adjustments, won't they, in terms of their defense, uh, like they have after past bombardments. Uh, only this time, um, they're going to have the support of a lot more people uh, around the world for their resistance. So, ha haven't Israel really legitimized Hamas as much as anything after this genocide? that they've carried out in Gaza? Well, it's very interesting because Israel, obviously, and a lot of Western nations, including the UK and the US, designate Hamas a terrorist organization. In which case, if you're dealing with terrorists, it's a branch of criminality. So therefore, Hamas should be, in the language of the West, treated as a criminal organization rather than a national government. And you can't have a war against a criminal organization. You can only really have uh, police-like activities to arrest. So we've got a war against, uh, against who exactly? Um, but having said that, you know, the way Israel is acting is that this is a war not just against Hamas, but against every member of uh, Palestinian society. Uh, widely reported this morning, of course, doing the rounds on X was a sort of bizarre spectacle, uh, blood curdling spectacle, really, of Israeli forces dressed in doctor scrubs and women's clothes who broke into uh, a hospital in the West Bank city of Jenin not in not in the in, in gaza at all um and proceeded to assassinate three people in their hospital beds uh in what even mainstream commentators are describing as a terrorist or certainly terrorist looking um escapade i mean absolutely bizarre it looks like something almost out of a comedy film to see these uh, it's, it's caught on camera by the security cameras in the hospital to see these uh, people, somebody dressed as a woman and then someone else dressed as a doctor suddenly pulling out machine guns 
and uh, going around the hospital starting to execute people uh, a death squad simple as that uh, and this uh, again i mean of course they, they the israelis claiming the dead men were mohammed jalaman a spokesperson for hamas's military wing a member of islamic jihad and his brother and allegedly all three were active in the umbrella force known as the Jenin Battalion. But the medical director of the hospital said they were quite simply executed in cold blood. No due process or anything like that. Unbelievable. That That, that is just like uh, uh, beyond the pale. I mean, this is in the West Bank, by the way. It's uh, But again, Hamas, Hamas. It's, it's the sort of skeleton key, isn't it, Basil? It's like the Swiss Army knife. Uh, they can just drop that name. They're, they're even going after the UN uh, uh, Relief and, and Works Agency, uh, providing humanitarian aid uh, to the Gaza Strip, uh, calling them a terrorist organization, claiming that 10% of this UN Relief Agency are uh, linked to or uh, affiliated with or connected to Hamas. Therefore, we must defend, uh, defund them and destroy this agency. It's a terrorist organization. This is literally what they're saying uh, across the Israeli and U.S. media uh, at the moment. It's unbelievable. And there was a dreadful propaganda cartoon in the Washington Post this morning uh, depicting a, a UNRWA relief truck with uh, a graphic on the rearview mirror saying, you know, watch out, terrorists may be closer than you think, um, copying the uh, warning sign that a lot of trucks carry, you know, indicating that there may be children or pedestrians uh, that the driver of the truck cannot see. Um, but of course, you know, if Hamas has been the government of uh, the Gaza Strip for several years, and the relief agency provides jobs to thousands of people, it's inevitable that some members of the relief agency would also be members of the governing party. Um, you know, just as in China, there is huge membership of the Communist Party. And in the United States, a lot of people belong to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that anybody in the United Nations Relief Agency had anything to do with plotting October the 7th or taking part in it. Uh, it simply means that, uh, perhaps for reasons of their own career advancement or whatever, they are supporters of the government party who won elections the last time they were allowed to hold any. Very telling indeed. Very telling indeed. Now, uh, United, United Kingdom, uh, David Cameron, this uh, new type of foreign minister who doesn't sit in the House of Commons but lives over in the Lords, Lord Cameron, as he's now known, uh, he's weighed in with a pretty big statement, but how significant is this? Or are we looking at PR damage control? Uh, he's talking about a Palestinian state. What do you make of this? Well, Cameron has always been a two-stater, or so he claims, you know, that he believes that there is the potential for a viable Palestinian state. I'm not quite sure exactly where. And uh, if the UK was to go ahead and recognize a Palestinian state in advance of any major peace talks or conference or even the conclusion of the present hostilities, that would be a very significant development. I mean, it was only a few days ago that the so-called Labour Party, which is supposed to be traditionally more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, started off by echoing uh, Netanyahu's veto on a Palestinian state, only then to row back and start saying no neighbor should have a veto on the establishment of a state by uh, their adjacent neighbors. Uh, and now it seems Cameron has gone that bit further, but he only said might, uh, the UK might recognize a Palestinian state. So in the diplomatic language and the choreography of what's going on at the moment, it's a sort of warning shot across the Israelis' bows. It's the first indication of any kind of, I wouldn't even call it pushback, but as you know, a line in the sand, I don't know, sand gets washed over by the sea on the beach and the line disappears. So, you know, 
it's a milk toast comment, really. I mean, the significant thing would be if Britain just went ahead and unilaterally recognised a Palestinian state. Um, but nevertheless, it's a slightly more moderating tone, put it that way. It would be interesting, you know, Basil, with this uh, genocide convention, uh, if if, if a, a vote does go after South Africa's uh, preliminary uh, ruling, if a vote does go to the UN Security Council, let's say the United States vetoes it, Britain abstains, etc., then gets kicked over to the UN General Assembly under United for Peace resolution, they will vote as well on a ceasefire. Uh, and they might vote for some other things as well that are going to go along with that. One of them would be uh, admitting Palestine as a UN member. Okay. Now that'll yeah. be interesting because if that happens and suspends Israel as a UN member, if that happens, it will be interesting to see how Britain votes on that issue when it arises. Will it be consistent with David Cameron's statement or will they do a U-turn? That will be very telling. So put that in the margins uh, on your notes for the future. It's uh, uh, something to look at in the future. But I I'm guessing they won't well, vote uh, recognizing a Palestinian state. No, I, I, I can't. To be honest, I mean, I hope it happens. But I can't see it happening outside of the sort of major peace conference that people like the Chinese are calling for uh, at the end of hostilities, which I think would be great to see. Um, but uh, whether or yeah. not it would have the bona fide participation of the Israelis is another matter altogether. Um, Sunak is, you know, arguably one of the most ardently Zionist prime ministers Britain has ever had. I mean, they've all been Zionists really since, you know, before Harold Wilson or whatever. But um, Sunak had taken a particularly strong stance. I mean, when he went to Tel Aviv, uh soon after october the 7th you know he said we want you to win to the war criminal uh, facing corruption charges benjamin netanyahu um and claimed that the people of britain stand with israel which of course they don't the vast majority of them do not uh and he's since then he's doubled down it mm. seems uh you know it is interesting that sunak's own religion and ethnicity are uh, Indian and most notably Hindu. Uh, the name Rishi is a, a term used in Hindu spirituality to note some to denote somebody of tremendous spiritual stature. They are called a Rishi, but these names are appropriated by Indians for their children. Now we know that the global South has all but unanimously uh, supported the Palestinian cause over the last few months, but not India, or at least not Hindu India under Modi, because uh, they feel that they have the same sort of ethno-nationalist ideology as Zionism. And one wonders the extent to which that uh, additionally affects Rishi Sunak's thinking. Mm. That's just true. This is true. They have a similar sort of ideological bent there. We're talking about the Modi government uh, and the BJP and the sort of Hindu nationalism. Uh, no, it's Tulsi right. it's the only. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, Mo Modi and Netanyahu are quite close. Mm. And, uh, you know, India is the only, interesting, it's in BRICS, of course, um, with South Africa, who've led the genocide charge. Um, but uh, India is far and away Israel's best ally in the global south, put it that way, until the advent of Malay. <laughs> Malay, Javi, we'll leave that for another uh, conversation. Uh, as months go on, we'll see if he's um, actually delivering or whether it was all hype. Uh, that he was the greatest libertarian on the pl face of the planet so like literally the libertarian messiah the 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 right and right wing in the west have been treating him like he was the sort of you know the libertarian messiah r riding into buenos aires on a donkey you know what i mean so um or maybe not maybe riding in on a sort of chevy uh suv blacked out suv but that's another one so yeah, the, he's, um, quite a, he's quite a character, isn't he? Um, <laughs> yeah, he but is. he, that is a different subject. I just want to get back to Gaza. Uh, the population is at the border of famine. 
according to the World Health Organization spokesperson Christian Lindmeier, uh, speaking at a briefing in Geneva today. He said a convoy had tried to reach NASA hospital in Khan Yunis this morning with patients, healthcare staff, everybody there needing food, but the very needy population uh, before the truck reached Khan Yunis took the supplies. The incident shows how dire the needs are, he said. And on top of that, of course, Israeli protesters and relatives of hostages are gathered at the Kerem Shalom border crossing, aiming to block trucks carrying humanitarian aid from entering Gaza. A statement from the protest organizers, known as Order 9, the Tazav 9 movement, urges that no aid should pass until the last of the hostages returns. It continues, there is no logic in having the trucks enter directly into the hands of Hamas terrorists. Dozens of others are headed to the Nitzada border crossing in Gaza's north. Now, of course, if these protesters are allowed to prevent humanitarian aid getting into Gaza, I mean, it's one thing to wave placards at the side of the road while the trucks go by. It's quite another if, you know, your actions actually prevent the trucks getting through, because that, of course, is another direct contravention of the ICJ ruling. So, you know, at what point does the United Nations say, well, you know, our ruling, the ruling of our highest court is being totally disregarded and ignored. Therefore, we have to take action and, for example, ensure that aid gets through to avoid genocide, avoid famine, uh, and put their own troops at these border crossings. You know, is that a realistic possibility, Patrick? No, <laughs> I'd like to see it. I, 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 my personal opinion is, um, when it comes to that region, Israel does not like other people playing around in their backyard, uh, and they like to be in control of everything. I don't think I cannot see a foreign military stepping foot in there armed. Maybe some unarmed arrangement, or you know, the UN peacekeepers with with uh, blank bullets, kind of thing. Uh, that's it. Um, they're very they're very strict on that israeli so i'd like to see it i'd like to see it i'd like to see uh maybe turkey or another sort of you know middle eastern country that has a uh an interest in the in the in the welfare of the people in that region i'd like to see that i i wouldn't want to see a gulf state a, a, a group of troops in there because there, there might be that sort of hostility uh underlying hostility between them and the people of gaza um and then with israel knowing that there's a possibility to inflame some relationship it would only take a false flag or an assassination to start another sub-conflict within the conflict uh basil it's very risky when you're dealing with um israel because it's in their interest to basically sabotage any such deal basil any such deal and then revert back to their status quo that's all they seem to want i don't see any uh recommendations no ideas coming out of tel aviv uh basil nothing i just see like the the argument in israel is should between the left and the hard right is uh, should we do ethnic cleansing or or genocide that the argument in Israel is should between the left and the hard right is uh, should we do ethnic cleansing or or genocide? That that's yeah, that's, that's basic. Don't, don't. I, it's, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm afraid. Yeah, no, I'm afraid you're right, and and they've totally disregarded the ICJ ruling, and they've been given cover not just by the British and American governments, but by the media as well. This is very they, they have though. they have they have Basil Valentine. Thank you for joining us on TNT this week. Amazing insights, great reporting. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, and Basil Valentine, Blake Lovewell, uh, and also uh, our guest, Benjamin Rubenstein, in the first hour as well. Great program. Everybody, we got a big, big show for you tomorrow. Special guest lined up. I'm looking forward to it. You will be surprised when you see who we have on screen. And we're going to get into the issues in a way we haven't before. Take care, everybody. All the best. Patrick Henningsen, your host, signing out. <laughs>